welcome to In the Mode. My name is Ron Curtis, along with Aaron Weiner, and we're pleased to have as our first interview guest, Mr. Larry Carlton, jazz guitarist extraordinaire. Larry? Very Hello. pleased to have you a pleasure here. Pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Uh, Larry's new album is uh, called Sleepwalk. You can pick that up on there. There you go. Hi. Shirt That's by Van Dusen. Uh. Shirt by Van Dusen, <laughs> right? That's on Warner Brothers Records. It has yielded a hit single, which is the title track of the album. Thank you. Called Sleepwalk, and uh, we're really glad to have you here. You could fit us into your schedule. Pleasure. And. Um, is there going to be any touring that's going to be happening to support this album sometime in the near future? The success future? of the album and the single and so on. Yeah. Uh -huh. The uh, plans right now are to definitely do a West Coast tour. Mm -hmm. As far as a tour across the states, I would doubt it. Uh, the album's a little bit ahead of us now. Mm -hmm. so we're going to tour. We should have been out maybe last month, but I was busy promoting the record as opposed to you know, promoting the record on a one-to-one -one basis with the Warner Brothers people as opposed to playing. But yes, I would say by June, middle of June, maybe we'll start a West Coast tour. Mm -hmm. uh, we wish to offer our congratulations on the success of your solo efforts. Thank you. Um, the majority of your fans out there are carryover fans from your session work. Uh -huh. uh, they never knew what you looked like. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the face. <laughs> right. This is the face behind the fingers. Okay. Right. Um, we've read in various places that. Whereas you used to do 25 recording dates a week, you, uh, you've cut down to that many maybe in a year. Right. Uh, also, you used to, uh, you don't even leave your house anymore to do your recording sessions to a great degree. Right. Also, I've read that you have a bit of an aversion to outside producers. Now, I see a pattern there. Uh, obviously, you're a very independent musician, yes. but with a great deal of experience in the business. I was curious what experience led you to these attitudes of liking to do it yourself, as it were. I think, as you said, doing 20 sessions a week for three or four years, that's five, six hundred sessions a year, it became a job. In the beginning, I really enjoyed that. I felt I was contributing to the records I was playing on. I was learning. I was playing, I've always said this in my interviews, but I was playing with some of the best musicians in the world every day, nine or ten hours a day, and getting paid for it. So you're making money, your growth as a musician is phenomenal. As I say, working with that caliber of players mm. all of the time. But doing it that much, it became a job. And I noticed in about 1976, I started not enjoying, I wasn't looking forward to going to those sessions. I wanted to give because I'd been giving for the past five years. I go to a mm -hmm. session, I'll give them the best I can all of the time. So to me that was an indication that possibly it was time to make some kind of a change. I didn't want to do a session and not play my best because my heart yeah. wasn't into it. It was, you know, I wouldn't do it just for the money. So at that time I became interested in record production. Mm -hmm. um, have you ever had producers produce your solo projects, other producers other than yourself? No. Oh, I see. So you have no. complete con creative control over everything that yes. you do. In fact, when I, was, when I made the decision to uh, be a solo artist, CBS Records was the first company that approached me, and uh, they gave me a certain amount of money to do a demo for them so they could see what direction I was going to go since I was leaving the Crusaders, who I'd been with for four or five years. And they heard the songs and the demos and liked them very much and wanted to put one of their A&R men with me in the studio as a producer. And at the time, like I say, it just didn't make sense to me. I hadn't tried it by myself yet. Mm -hmm. So why give that control to someone else or share that control with someone mm -hmm. else until I've either made it or proven myself or not proven myself. So I did not go with CBS Records and went with Warner Brothers for that reason. Well, is the reason that you don't use a producer, is it, I mean, is your aversion to producers only in your case, or is it sort of a general kind of um, a philosophy towards the music industry? No. And it's in my case. It's just in your case. Yes. I see. Yes. Uh, this may sound a little strange, but when I produce and make my music, I'm not trying to produce a hit record. That's not the motive behind Larry Carlton being You're an artist. You're doing what you want to do. Exactly. Right. And I, well, that's what you were signed to do. Yeah, except in, in a sense. it is, it is, but you know how record, it's a business. The, the record, record company really expects they do you to expect, put out something. But I, made, I gave a lot of thought to becoming a solo artist and I structured my deal with Warner Brothers so that 
I didn't take a lot of dollars from them, so they don't have to expect a top 10 single from me every mm -hmm. time out. I took a high percentage and a low dollar ratio. If we catch a hit, we're all going to make money. If we don't, nobody loses a great deal of money. Sort of on spec then, it's sort of how it's structured. Yeah, except they are paying all of the costs to yeah. do it. Mm -hmm. So to me, that was a very comfortable way of starting to produce my own records. And I, they know that I have the attitude, I'm not trying to produce a hit record. Well, then it has to be especially exciting that you have produced yes. somewhat of a hit record. Yes, and some of the circumstance leading to the Sleepwalk cut it's the only tune on the Sleepwalk album I didn't compose. It was suggested by the vice president of Lorimar Records, who's a friend that I've produced records for. He said, I have a great idea. I think you ought to try cutting Sleepwalk your way. And what you hear on the Sleepwalk album is the second take, one mm, night, great. and I added strings and mixed it. And it's the most successful t song that I've had yet. But again, I wasn't going for a hit record. I was experimenting with an outside piece of material that was suggested by an A&R person that I respected. Your, uh, your music is, uh, you've described it as kind of a hybrid, varying different styles and mm -hmm. things. Uh, when, when you were growing up, before you became a session player and everything, who were you listening to? Who were you kind of getting any sort of influence from when you were growing up? Well, I started playing guitar when I was six. So early influences would be uh, Joe Maphis, very famous country guitar player of the late 50s. Um, Jimmy Bryant a little bit, another country picker. And then in those first two or three years, I was listening to pop music. So I was learning solos off Elvis Presley records, hmm. Bill Haley and the Comets, those kinds <laughs> of things. Yeah. So those were early influences. But at age 14 is when I really became interested in jazz. And I got into Joe Pass and Wes Montgomery, Johnny Smith, Barney Kessel. And I didn't own one blues album until I was 16 years old. And that's the first time I paid attention to B.B. King mm -hmm. and fell in love with what he was doing. So we've had country, jazz, blues, and I became a Jeff Beck, Eric Clapton fan when there I was about go. 19 years old. So I was late catching on to their styles. Mm -hmm. uh, there seems to be quite a few uh, players in the business now that seem to have this type of a hybrid style. Are there any other of your peers that you especially admire or that you would perhaps like to work with sometime in the future? There has to be someone. There has to be. There has to be someone. As you say, a lot of the, a lot of my peers that are well-known session musicians now had the same benefits of different styles getting into that hybrid situation. And I think that was because stereo equipment became so much better from the 50s into the 60s into the 70s right. you could actually hear what the guitar player was playing all the time to being mixed in sure, with else. old mono records so <laughs> i think the reason we're seeing more of that kind of player now is because of the technology i have a question mm -hmm. that applies to that exactly do you yes i do <laughs> in fact i'll ask you too you can answer too but you <laughs> probably don't know the answer Fine. Well, but he does okay that's why, that's why we hired him to come okay, on the show okay shoot okay um, in line with what you just said. Mm -hmm. Musicians have honed their skills to such an incredible degree. Now, I'm speaking mainly in terms of the rock genre, because mm -hmm. jazz, before they were making you know, any rock recordings, uh, their skills were quite honed. But as far as rock and roll goes, you listen to oldies and you listen to music progressing through the 60s and the 70s. Musicians have honed their skills. There are such brilliant players out mm -hmm. there who know exactly how to shape a perfect, beautiful track. Right. On the other hand, you've got the technology improving and evolving to such a high degree. It's to the point where a perfect sounding track is so common nowadays mm 